You're on camera. <laughs> okay, so uh, we have a point and a rate, and we want to We want to draft the logs. So we have this point. It's the worst I have ever drawn. Oh no. Better. Okay. Point and a rate. How are we going to graph? So you're going to. So I saw that, like, no matter what you did, you could graph the rates, but it always have no vertical shift. So I was like, okay, so we have to think about how we can vertically shift this function to the one before it. And I thought when you talked about the y old and the y new, well, the y new would be the value in the second function, while well, the y old was uh, in the previous function. So I, I thought about that, and it's just like with the vertical mirrors have the y equals new x plus b. I used that in the y old and the y new, and I solved for that vertical shift, and I just threw it onto the uh, function, so it would shift to the previous one. Does that make sense? Okay. Other <coughs> so um, did anybody from the beginning um, think to use the point slope form that I was had taught you in two different classes from the beginning. Okay, that's good. All right, because this is exactly this is a perfect application of that. You, like I said, you've got a point and you've got this rate, and so the point slope form is just designed to do exactly that. Yeah. I mean, that's it, I took it almost literal a piecewise function. So each one is its own little function, and I just would only focus on one little function, mm -hmm. and then shift over, and it kind of just piece together like a puzzle. Okay, right. So how does uh, any other, like, so maybe it doesn't have to be about, like, what you did, but just um, anything about accomplishing this task. So did you have emotion? Did you have a, an emotional experience or anything you want to reflect upon when you were building this particular one or something you learned? Yeah, that's good. For me, because it was just challenging enough to where my brain wasn't hurting, but where I had to just think about it a little bit once I got to that point, it was kind of fun. Okay, good. So, I don't know. Yeah, Julia. I was stuck where Carter and she was looking at this. Because where she was stuck, where it was a vertical shift and a vertical line. Then I went away from it for a couple days. And then I used the strategies we talked about in class about writing down the math. Nice. Then <clears throat> that helped me. Okay, and did you, was it kind of like you figured out something on your own, or did you kind of have the epiphany of maybe it's that thing that we thought about um, in class? Either or fine. I mean, I, I use slope, I use slope intercept form, not point slope, but I, I got it through that. I, I don't know. You got that. It just helped me. Okay, Stephen? Well, I struggled, and I came back and sat down and got up a couple of times, and then I remember you kept saying about, Remember, we're going to use this in a uh, assignment due later on. Okay. And I was like, well, we haven't used it yet, so let me try it. And I put it in and it worked. Okay. Other reflections on this assignment? Richard? Uh, I tried doing it, then I walked away, had a few beers, and then I came back. <laughs> and like, I just kind of worked on it. Group and then I had the epiphanies. And that's how I figured it out. I remember you talking about that. That's when I applied it. Okay. You can, you can replay that on the video. <laughs> okay, um, how does this, this project um, show the deficiency of y equals mx plus b? How does it show that? Turner. Because with the exception of the first part of the function, the first part of the piecewise, the rest of it doesn't cross the y-axis, so you don't get a y-intercept. Okay. 
Does does your sec does the second piece here have a have a y intercept? Okay. Right? Without the restriction, it does, but with the restriction, it doesn't. And what's the meaning of it? What's the meaning of that point? Nothing. He says nothing. It's a reference point. A reference point? When you're going to use y equals mx plus b, I mean, you need it. Okay. And besides that, but much for you. Yeah, it doesn't have meaning relative to this function, right? So, so nothing is the correct response. So if this is representing something, we don't know what, but it's representing something, then the, the y-intercept of that second piece, we could con concoct a virtual situation, like we could, but it, really, it, it doesn't have relevance to this particular situation. And so that's this is one um, one you know, reason why the point slope form is is always an advantageous form. Okay. Other questions or comments about this one? Okay. How about the uh, average rate animator? That was the next one. So, is it harder or easier? <coughs> All right. So I want to hear. So Rochelle, you said it's easier. What's so for you? You asked us to do it in two different ways, both parametrically and then also using a line equation, okay. um, like in our standard sense. So, um, so parametrically, I thought about what we had done several weeks back, where we wanted to construct a line between two points, A and B. Okay. Um, and so with that same idea, I figured, well, my two points are not just specific points anymore, they're gonna be changing points um, in reference to x is equal to h and x is equal to n. So I just generated those two like vector type points first and then um, played with the idea of, of taking one minus t um, and figuring out, do it, did I wanna go from h to n or did I wanna go from n to h? Does that make sense? Like I didn't know which one should be my first starting point, which one should be my ending point. Um, so I don't know, I just, I just found it relatively easy because it wasn't, the, step, the project beforehand was more of like a puzzle, kind of like Matt said. We had pieces that we had to put together, whereas this one I found it was all self-contained. You just, you didn't have to work with puzzle pieces. You just had to figure out the two points and then how to generate a line between those two points. Okay. Other, so who else wants to chime in? Whether you thought it was easier or harder, Maria? Once I figured out the points, and two, and once I figured out that, because at first I just had n plus one for the next point, so it was just graphing n plus one, so it was the same exact distance every single time, but then I figured out that we have that slider h, and I ended up using h, but then I couldn't find a line for, I couldn't find how to plot the line between the two points, and then I, then I started playing out with, with the slope form. The I took yeah, I took the n and then I took the n plus h for my axis. So then I started figuring that out and then finally found the line. Okay. Cool. Other comments? Jessica? I just wanted to say for me this was really hard and yeah, it's so more of the most important. And I didn't realize that at first. And I ended up coming up with lines that were like it looked like there was Fish jumping in and out of my design. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't working for a long time. Okay, so can you can you be more specific about what was making it difficult? Um, I don't know. I guess it, for me, it was mostly trying to like I would say anchor the two ends of my line to the graph because they just wanted to go everywhere. I don't even know how. That okay. Other. Somebody new. Jackie. I think that it wasn't, I think I got the equation, just the XY equation, like pretty quickly after I figured out what my two points were in relation to like what I really like tried to figure out what N was representing, what X was in, what H represented. Right. So that and how it relates to, so when N 
with the start of our month interval, what the end of my point would be in relation to age. So, right. so once I found the two points, I was able to get the xy equation pretty quickly. And then parametrically, I knew how to bound my x's. And I was having trouble bounding the y's because so far, when we use parametrics, it was usually the graph. Like for the box problem, it was to graph these are horizontal and vertical lines. Okay. So not like a line with a slope. And I don't know why, like now looking at it, I like, I don't know if I was working on it too long, so I like was working on it for a lot, long time, and then I like got up for like an hour, and then went back, and I got up another minute. Like I was like, I just have to bounce my guys to save me, like bounce my hat, because it's just like, I don't mind for me. Okay. Like once I figured out how, what my X and Y values were in relation to any age, and how I used that, and I used that in here, and I had to like draw the difference. Okay. Cool. Other questions on this? What did you did you prefer it as a um, a point slope you know, y x equation or did you prefer it doing it parametrically? That's something new. As in, okay. You guys, Kyle and I'll, Kyle. Yeah, I kind of like parametrically better because I got that one first, and then with the line, like I messed up on a negative sign on accident, and I couldn't figure out the life move. So I feel like you can mess up a lot easier than the other. Okay. Other people, would you, Daniel, Raymond, what you guys prefer? Uh, Did you prefer uh, the point slope form? What's that? It's called point slope. Point slope form, yeah. I found that one to be a little easier because I remember <coughs> in your class. And that one is, in my mind, just was easier. The parametric one was easier. Yeah. Okay. Grant, anything to? I thought the uh, y equals x form came a little more intuitively to me, but okay. I think the parametric form is a lot prettier. Okay. <laughs> so uh, the thing I, the, the, the place I found a uh, struggle in this was. Um, keeping track of what n is and what x is and what h is, right? Because that, so the, you really have to know what all those things mean. So there's, this is how I used a point slope form. Is this, anyone, theirs look like this? No. Similar. Similar. Messier. Messier. I like them so. That restriction at the end. What's that? I, I didn't put the restrictions on until I graphed it. So then I, when I put the restrictions on, when I actually graphed it. So the function itself, I just I just cr created the whole line. And then when I graphed it, I just graphed the part of it. What's your parametric look like? Uh, I didn't do it. Do you think I can? Yeah. <laughs> I forgot. Um, <laughs> yeah. I didn't know we were supposed to do it for parametric. She reminded me this morning that it looked like both ways. Both ways. Okay. So uh, comments on comments on how I used the point slope form to do this versus how you used it. So a lot different, similar. Appreciate you had. No, no, it's the same. It's the same. Yeah, so, so the, the, the one thing that caused me pause as I created this was what, what, what are the x's and what are the n's, right? And it really makes you think about what does n represent and what does x represent. How, how, could you describe, how, could, how would you describe to a student what x represents? What does x represent in g of x in this? Got to know that. Yeah, well, it was like a, the like the vertical position of where your point could be. If that makes sense. Okay, which point? Uh, on your on your function, on your cosine of x. Okay, so I'm I'm speaking specifically yeah, to, g, to this yeah, one, right? G, yeah, so g, g of x. x, what does the x represent? Oh, okay. And then and those line segments. How would you describe that? So go ahead. No, I was going to just say the 
position of, of the vertical position of g of x of that line. I don't have it. Okay. Keep making it there. Uh, sorry, were you, you going to respond? Carter. Um, the x coordinate of any point on that line. He wants the x coordinate of any point on that line. What do you think? It's me. Tyler, you hear that? So does it, does every it, option you have, I guess he already did now, I think, because every end. Does it have to do with n? Is it a moving, changing n? No. Yeah, so we're building a function, right? So, it's, so it's, we're building a function, and we're going to have lots of x's, right? And g of x is going to be? All the, all the corresponding y's, right? So x, g of x is all the ordered pairs on the resulting line. Okay. Where n, what is, n is an x value, what is n? Smallest x value? <coughs> the way it's like the lower bound of your. Yeah, like the, the smallest x that you're going to plot on the, the portion of the line that you want to graph. That's right. Like, yeah. So it's the least, exactly. The least value of x or the right, the right side of the segment. So, yeah, so when you're putting that thing together, you got to figure out where's that an x and where's an n, right? So. Right, yeah. So it's like a location where you should be looking for your x to be within. And n will be the lower portion of that zone, and n will stay to be the upper And then portion. what is h? Is h an x value? What was it? H. Is h an x value? Victoria, what do you think? Is h an x value? Mm -hmm. H is the inner point. So is H an X value? Yeah. Yeah. So when you say it's the integral, the integral is not a value. So no. what H, what does that H value mean? Is that, is that, a, is that an X value, H? So it's the width, it's the width of the interval, or how does it relate to x? What do we call that? Change. Yeah, change of x, delta x, right? It's a change of x. Okay, any more <laughs> comments, questions, things to share about doing this one? Okay, do you feel like you're getting better? Do you yeah. feel like you're improving in your ability to use this and somewhat? Somewhat. Okay. All right, so how did the uh, how did your analysis go for Where is it? Here it is. So did you uh, did you like this little assignment? First of all, did you like it? it or no? Yeah. It's rigid. It was interesting. Interesting? To, it was interesting. Yeah, to, yeah, to think about what it's being used for and okay. to actually get to see how like for us who are still learning how to use programming, we could also see how things are done. To get certain right. That was a big part of that. Was to, there's some some new elements that we want to start using in our file. So I wanted you to, to kind of learn how it works by studying somebody else's. Yeah, for sure. Daniel. In a sense, it was kind of fun because you got to play with it a little to figure out what the heck is going on. Right. And uh, I changed my answer several times as I, I played with it a little more. Like, oh, that's not right at all. Okay. So. Excellent. Yeah, I did the same thing. I thought it was interesting to be able to figure each part of it out. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, so we need to understand the, the, the nuts and bolts, the pieces, but then, then we have a chance to make sense of the whole thing. Um, that's, but that's still not a guarantee, right? So you got to figure it out. For sure. Once, like we were working on, on the train, and once we figure out what the floor function did, everything else made a lot more sense. Okay. Then we finally started to see like what it was actually trying to show us, like what all the values. Okay, cool. So let's kind of go through it. So dx, what was that slider for? What's the dx slider for? Maria? I'm pretty sure that that one is the one that kept giving us a segment. So um, it went from segment 3 to 0, 2.01. So meaning that as my graph continued, the change in x was accounted for every single time or in a segment of three. I'm pretty sure that's what that one did. It was just moving, either making the segment the biggest it could be at three or smaller. OK. <coughs> Anyone else have an idea about that, Richard? I think it kind of was changing the interval for our floor function. That's what it seemed like. OK, changing the interval width. Yeah, so changing the interval width. Okay, so um, let's just get to you. Oh. Something else running. That's really dragging. I don't know. There must be something else in my computer that's running. Um, oh, it's also taking a while. Maybe it'll go better. Than yeah, here we go. Okay. Oh, and so then, I don't remember if I've told you this before or not, but you notice how the slider will increase to its maximum, and slider will increase to its maximum, and then come back to its minimum. You can get it just to only go forward by hitting option play. If you hold down option and hit play, oh, that's much better. Okay. It'll just, when it gets to the end, it'll start over. It'll only go, it'll only go forward. When you get it to the back. What's that? Pause it and just hit play. Don't hit option play. So when it's just when each time that you, you hit play, um, you're telling shift to play on PCs. Is it shift play? I think so. And it's drag. So I don't know. No, it's control. Is it? Control play? Control, control play on PC. Okay. So, um, right. So dx is, is um, the interval size for x. Um, what about this b? What did you... What was the purpose of the B slider? That one we can't really, really figure out. Okay. It um, it traced the value of n, and the reason it wasn't on the x-axis itself is because we already had something else being traced on there. So you had to pull the distance away, and B told you the distance below the x-axis it would trace it at. Okay. So B, you're saying how far the, the red, red line. one is tracing. Yeah. Okay, and so why why do we want that? What's the point of having that at a different? Because it shows that, it's to help highlight that the fact that the DX only changes with equal amounts of X, but then the red slider is your constant change of X as it keeps going. Okay, so, but the question is, why do we need this B slider to move that thing up and down? Why, do, why did anyone figure that out? In case if you zoom in further and you want to like, it's like a tracking point and if you zoom in further, you move the line closer. So if you zoom in further, so he's saying, and then change B, what happens? Not only moves that red line closer, but what else? Moves that center. Moves that. What? What? It makes the purple line center. Oh. Yeah. I noticed that. So who can summarize what, what the purpose of B is, the B slider? We're on to it here. So let's zoom back out again. Let me zoom out again. Just to make it more visible. 
So now I'm going to change B. I zoomed out. Yeah, it's just strictly about you know what for what function values you're going to be for a particular function that you choose. If you, depending on how you're going to um, zoom out on the y-axis, it helps it to. So this this is a pretty good view here, but if our function you know looked at much smaller values of y around zero, then this wouldn't be optimal, right? I should have just done the y-axis. Sorry. There we go. Every time I zoom, though, it, it struggles again. Okay. All right, so does it does what the B make sense? Like as you change that function, your your range of y values would, will be different. And and for any to, to show a good to show the graph in a nice view, will mean then changing how far that thing is down and how how wide that is. Okay, so hopefully you know you dug into this and. Try to figure out what was going on. So let's let's just get to the talking about um, the purpose of this. What did you think maybe the purpose of this animation was for? Any ideas? Yeah. Kind of building building upon the previous lessons. Because when I first saw this, I thought it was your uh, your constant rate of change. When you showed us one time ago, then you move the slider, you kind of see that you see all the other elements are. Okay. So there we go. All right. It almost kind of seems like it's building the idea of a derivative by using average rates of change, and then making the interval of change smaller and smaller. And okay. that's where, sort of like, how we use the floor. If we keep making the floor interval smaller and smaller, then students sort of kind of start seeing like that instantaneous rate of change. Okay. Um, I had trouble like trying to distinguish what it was on my own, but since what we've talked about right now, um, it just seems like when you're when you're viewing the entire graph, so when you have all parts showing, um, you're seeing for equal increments of changes in X, okay. you're seeing how the changes in Y can um, be different each time, if that makes sense. So like, um, for equal changes of x, when x is changing, like on your scale, you have x changing by 1.4 roughly. Um, okay. When your graph is graphed, your changes in y are not always going to be consistent. If, you know what I'm talking about? Okay. It's when you have the vertical line that starts showing in the next view. Okay. So if I want to look at view number one, Need to zoom out again here. So each time <laughs> your um, horizontal line is increasing by the same amount, like each time it links to a new um, x value. Okay. Those little chunks are exactly the same. It's one point four. But the corresponding y changes or the vertical lines are different lengths. It's not. The same every single time. Okay. So I guess that's what I was thinking. Oh, nice. Yeah. Victoria. You can almost think of it like when you're graphing a line, or not a line, when you're like graphing a, some sort of g of x, like when you, if it's x or x, or like anything, when you graph a line or anything really, you, you can like section it off so you're only graphing from 0 to 1, and then you can figure out what that will be, and then from 1 to 2, what that will be. And this one, like, it exemplifies like for each little part, like the parts of the graph, like where the black dot is, and not too many. Nice, yeah. These are these are really good comments. Other comments? <coughs> yeah, Grant. I kind of interpreted it as like uh, kind of like a quadrature error. So if you're doing integration, and it looks like since you have this width, and it stays at that function value for the width of that interval. 
And if you're going to construct a piecewise complementary change, then in the next view it shows it. But kind of how if you keep it there, your function value is going to change. So it's really only approximation. Okay. You're all good. Good thoughts. So what if we came along here and we I stopped it right here and we said let's uh, let's go a little more further. How about Okay, that's good. So um, here we are and we're showing what what's being shown here, the function value at so our our Let's make our dx a little easier. Let's make our dx 1.5. Okay, so here's a dx of 1.5. And uh, so what's being shown by the purple right there? So what, what are we showing by the, the purple bars? Daniel? Do you see what I'm what I'm referring to? Yeah. So what are we showing by this right here? What is that showing? Maria. Is that the overall change of y with respect to x? The overall change in y with respect to x. So as x changes. Can you be more specific though? Like so for the interval of x, that change, we have a small change in our function that plus the y x y coordinate well I don't know how to explain this but I feel like I'm on the right track okay. as to what it yeah, is. Yeah, you are. Um, for two equal changes of x because we ended up two okay. one point fives, um, we have a change of y and it's like a little under a half. Okay. And where does that so where does that change come from, or where does that y coordinate come from? G of x. Right. So now suppose we wanted to predict what the next y value was going to be. How can we predict what the next y value is going to be? Okay, and how would, how would we get that? How could we predict that? Well, where will the next, what are we, what are we predicting? How about that? So I, I call it the next point. To be more specific, what, what are we predicting? Another change of 4.5 in x. Okay. Another change in 1.5 in x and the corresponding corresponding change. Okay. So how can we do it? Any way you can. Any way you can do it. How can you how can we predict the next y value? Which you're saying is at the x value of 4.5, is that right? Yeah. So we're so we're, we've gone through two changes of x. And now we're gonna go through one more. It's gonna take us to x equals 4.5. We just want to try to figure out, estimate what the y value would be. So, um, if you know that you're going to end up with an x coordinate or an x position of four and a half, um, I would use the function that I have okay. and input four point five into g of x, and that should give you the the y coordinate of your um, new point. And to do that, what do we need? In order to do that, oh, you need to know what the g of x function is, and you need to know how to do sine of 
Yeah. Can you do sine? Can you get an estimate for sine of four point five in your head? You know what that means, sine of four point five. Four point five radians. Yeah. So sine of four point five. What does that mean? In the first quadrant. In the first quadrant. Yeah. Third quadrant, more than halfway, yeah. revolution-wise. So remember, a radian is the angle that cuts off. It's actually less. An arc length of one radius. An arc length of one radius. Okay, so one. Yeah. Crash course, two. Three. How many radians is it halfway around? Pi. A little bit more than three, which is that's where pi comes from, right? So then we got four and five and six. Okay, so now so figure without doing it using any calculator or computer. So I want you to estimate what's the y value going to be of this function g of x when we get to the next, the end of the next interval. Everyone, do it. Do it. So do it. Yeah, that's a lot. Yeah. Oh, okay. So Because we got cut off ten percent. Okay, Raymond's got an idea. I say we're going to be like around four point something. Four point something. So, can you be more specific? What I was thinking is that uh, when you measure the, the sign, it's going to be a uh, sign of. 4.5 okay. like around 0.8 or 4.9. Okay. And is that the value of G then? Why not? Okay. So something less than 4.5. So you're saying around here. Okay, anybody else? Steven? Uh, we said about negative 4.5 because sine of 4.5 is roughly negative 1. Okay. Negative 1 times 4.5 is. So negative 4.5. So you like that better? Yeah. yeah, so all your reasoning was great. You just, you just said positive instead of negative. Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, somewhere, so less than or uh, above negative 4.5 or below? Steven? Above meaning a greater value than negative 4.5 or below meaning a lesser value, a more negative value? Uh, lesser value. So it would be 4.5. So like negative 4.4? Other? You like it? Everyone else likes it? All right, so let's see.
pretty dang good. Okay, do it again. So you do do it for the next one. So, um, do you think one example is you know for students? Does one example help solidify understanding? No. Right. So do so we do it again. So so do it again. So we'll do it for. Um, do it for the next one. Negative 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 one. I think that's two Okay, so this table, who wants to be the representative from this table to explain how you came up with something? I'm saying it's negative one third. Negative one third? Yeah. Is g of x. g of x, so like up here like this? Yeah. And how did you get that? So looking at the rule for g of x, Kyle. How did so piece that together for me? Coming up with negative one third. I saw that okay, the inner circle, the inner circle. If you do sine of six, right? Let's put the inner circle in one third. But it's at six. It's close to. Um, it's below the y-axis, like close, close to like one third. Below the on the y-axis of the inner okay. circle. And so maybe we have to multiply that by 6, too. So that would be maybe 6. So you got x is your 6, and then the sine of 6 you said was negative 1 third. So yeah. your estimate is? Negative 6.33. You're multiplying 1 third times 6, right? Yeah. Oh, shoot. So, two? Negative two? Negative is saying negative two. What do you think? Jessica? Um, I guess that it was probably about pi six below the x axis and zero. So, negative pi six, the angle, at the radian of six. So, I guess that using a reference triangle, sine of six is going to be probably. One over negative one over two. Okay. And then I multiply that by six and not negative two. Okay, so negative two, negative three. What are, what are the rest of you think, Carter? Uh, well, a full rotation is two pi, which is roughly six point two eight. Yeah. So six radians is very very close okay. to all the way around. So we kind of talked about how close we thought it was and kind of shifted between it be negative point two or negative point one. We put our y value between 
negative 1.2 and negative 0.6. Okay, so you think it's the y values way up here like this? Yes. How do I have it depicted? Close to what? So, all right, anyway. So you're all saying it's just about um, estimating that sign value, but you're all saying some something, some fraction of 6, like negative 3, negative 2, but you're saying even less. All right, well, let's see. So we're, let's uh, put those here. So 6. So here's negative 2. Here's negative 3. And here's negative 1. Okay, so, so that's one conversation you can have is, um, and this, so this conversation is really about understanding this function and namely sign, right? So just predicting y values. But, uh, so obviously this, this animation does a lot more. So now we have this, <coughs> we have this previous y value and the next y value. So what, how could we now take this to the next level in terms of students understanding covariation? What would be the next question that we might ask now that we've got these two y values? What is covariation? Well, I mean, we know we've changed x how much? 1.5. And then y has changed this much. We're comparing the changes between the two points. I mean, like, we have two points right now comparing the changes. Like, how's y changing with equal points of x? So we can find the average rate of change between them. Okay, so, and what, the average rate of change? So does does is this how y changes as we make that change in x? Is this how y changes in this graph? Daniel, say no. It doesn't seem right. Doesn't seem right. Yeah. All right. So how what could we do to find out besides turning on the graph, right? So turning on the graph would be just showing it. <coughs> so I'm giving you so if, if besides turning on the graph, how could we talk about how it changes? from that starting y value to that final y value. How could we investigate what's, is, if, if not this, what's really happening as x changes over this interval? Daniel? You would like find a point in between them. And so what would, how would we do that? Maybe de decrease the segment uh, that you're counting the, the x, y. So instead of going through Right. So change the change in x. Right, exactly. So, so by, change, by making the change in x smaller, we can start investigating then what's happening in between. All right, so I'm going to come back here. We'll just do this once. But um, So let's, what do you want to make the change in x? I'm going to leave it up to you. How should we, how should we make the new change in x? That? She wants 0.5. What do you think of that? Like it? Going the wrong way. Why does this go this way? Why does it, how we set it up? Yeah. The slider. Okay, so now we're going by 0.5s. And here we are again at 4.5. kind of in a different place than I put it. 
Oh, I put it where our prediction was. So our con is what we're asking is, how does it change from there to there? So we're gonna I'm gonna go to the next x value, predict what y will be, and this will help us to see how it's changing between those two. So go for it. I'm gonna go to the next y value, and you're going to. Let me put my circle back up. Okay. Julia, talk to me. How, how can we talk about? So I'm gonna. Um, we're gonna go to the next uh, change in x, and we want to know what the corresponding y is. So uh, x will be five. X will be five. Okay. That means that's five radians around the circle. Okay. So that's just past the uh, y. Okay. So we estimated that the y value would be, or the, the sine of x would be negative 0.8. Your point, yeah. And then, so when we plug that back into our function. So let me just stop you right there. Yeah. Eight tenths of the way down to the bottom? Okay, nine. <laughs> Even more. Yeah, 0.95 or even 9, 9.8, because you from there to there, you hardly see any vertical change, you see, from the very bottom. There's hardly any vertical change at all. Anyway, okay, keep going. And then you multiply that by 5, it's still our x. Something very close to 5. Something very close to 5. Okay, so is that falling on our line here? And if not, where is it relative? So below, like this? All right, let's check it out. And so, and so then how um, can we conclude, what can we conclude about the covariation of the, of the, of the Y? Between the, the two original points, we had. It's not linear comes from Okay, can you be more specific? So, for, yep, it's not linear. So, from here to here, <coughs> we want to say something more specific than it's not linear. What can we say? Grant? Um, doesn't have a constant rate of change. Okay. So. Can you be more specific. Uh, it looks like if you take that 0.5 step from our starting point, the change is actually going to be less than what we predicted at the last point. Okay. So over this interval, what's how is y changing then? What's our conclusion over this interval? How is y changing? As x changes, the change in y increase. As x changes, the change in y is increasing. So let's slower change at first, and then let's see. <coughs> yeah, I mean, even even lower than we thought, right? In fact, it may have even decreased. It may have even decreased. Okay. But the, the point is that um, 
So rather than showing the graph or, or telling the students, oh, just we'll make the interval smaller, it's like I put that responsibility back on you. You see that? To, to kind of think about, okay, so now we uh, suspect it's not going to be a constant rate between there and there. What could, what could we do to, to find out what it's going to be? In between. And you guys got to see make the... Yeah, so... Okay, and then we could turn on the view. To verify that, or to verify you know, what we came up with. Okay, any other, so any other questions about this? Okay, and there may be other uses for this as well. Okay, but the idea is getting things, students to think about how is y changing as x changes. And so in order to do that, you need to break it up into pieces, right? So in order to see how y is changing as x changes, we need to break it up into pieces. And then on the smaller level, we had two y values. Well, to see how it's changing in that part of the graph, we need to break it up into pieces, right? So that, that dx is adjusting the size of the interval to help us make that analysis where we're breaking it up into chunks. OK, so you're, I promised you uh, the next project would be longer and more challenging. And so here we go. Let's talk about it. No, that you, I think you'll like this. This is cool. Falling marbles. OK. So I'll read this. It's a little, the writing's a little small. This says the fictitious marble, so on the left, the red one, gets a running start and falls at a constant speed. The real marble falls by gravity and starts the exact moment that the fictitious marble passes it. So when it passes it and they're at the same height, that's when the real marble, the blue one on the, on the right, starts to fall. Give the fictitious marble a spin. So let's do that. So I, by hitting the end slider, head start, running start, releases the blue one. And then we'll fit. Okay? So this is tracking um, the, the fictitious marble time from when it starts to fall, from when it crosses the, the line to when it hits, and then the real marble time. And then after they hit, it just gives us, gives us the total time elapsed from release point. So I'll do it again. So watch the time for both of them doesn't start until they until the real marble starts to fall. So. See what's happening? Okay. So then, so the the kind of the activity that um, you can do with this is give the fictitious marble a speed so that so that it and the real marble will tie. What speed? So, so I can come up here. I can change the speed. So we want to give change the speed so that at this particular height, right now the height is set at the slider set at 1135. That's movable. Okay. So right now we're at 1135. So we want to your task or your assignment is to find the speed so that they tie. Okay, so you got your student hat on now. You get to be the recipient of, of this. So creator hat's coming later. So do it. Find the speed that we should make the falling, the fictitious marble so that they tie. Go, you can work together if you want. Only change the speed, not the height or anything. Just right, we're going to leave the height. We're just going to just change the speed. Just change the fictitious marble speed. Are we allowed to play around if we recreate it on here? Or do you not want us to do that? No. Just, just all the only information you get is what's shown on the screen. Okay. So don't, don't go to Wikipedia. Don't use, you know, just what's given right here. It starts a little bit higher and gets a head start, but then the time, the clock starts for both of them 
from the the real see this is the this is the height the actual this is the 1135 right here it's the real marble height so you get a little running start and then they fall together and that's when the clock starts when they start falling together based on the initial Here we go, ready? How are you guys doing, Steven and Maria? How are you guys doing? Yeah. All right, how about this? Should we make it faster or slower? Slower. Sub goals, right? Sub goals. Make it slower. So, what do you want to do? How should, what should I do? Maria? 100. 100. Awesome. Let's see. Okay, so now the, the point of that is not for you to now start like playing the whittle it down game, okay? So we got it. Yeah, we got it slower, but now it was too slow. So we want it without a lot of trial and error. Can we come up with a way to get it exactly? Well, we have to try to figure out a function that. That will travel, that will allow the fictitious marble to travel that same amount of distance. Same amount of distance. In the same amount of time. In the same amount of time. What is the other marble start? Is it 1135? They both start at 1135 when the clock starts. It's just that there's a little running start. Okay, so they, they're both at 11.35, that's when the clock starts for both of them, okay? So right, the clock starts now for both of them. Okay, did you guys get it? I said 135 earlier. I guessed that. You guessed that? Yeah. What do you want? 134 point what? Yeah, that's 0.76. 0.77? 0.77, yeah. Does that work? They came up with 134.77. Let's see. All right, so can you explain who, so who was, who was the, Kyle, <laughs> explain. Um, we know the distance it needs to travel and the time it needs to travel in, so it's just a constant rate of distance over time. Okay, so what does the fictitious marble represent about the real marble? <laughs> Is it the average speed? Yeah. Yeah, so because what is average speed? Actually, no, same distance. What about same distance, same time? No matter if we want them to hit at the same time, it just matter it's more efficient for the other. Okay. When you think about it. Whether that's a speed up or I just go this way. What is average speed? No. 
to accomplish the same amount of distance? Yeah, so, so you left out the constant speed part. So there's lots of different profiles that will reach the same distance at the same time, but the average speed is specifically constant speed. All right, so because it's fun, we'll do another one. How about a much higher one? How about 1865? Who wants to start with just a quick guess? 1865, how fast does it, does it have to go? Throw something out there. So that, that lower one was 135 about. One forty-five. Okay, find out what speed should the fictitious marble go at so they so that they tie. <laughs> But so now we don't want to guess. Maria, how are we going to find well, out? I, I guessed off of, we want to, we want to do it in 10.8 is it minutes or seconds. Okay, how far do you want and to go in 10.8? We want to do, sorry, what was that? How far do you, how, how? So 1865 is the distance we're going to travel. So okay. I just divided that by, I roughly divided that in my head. Nope. Going backwards. So maybe around 175 or 180. Okay, so and for that you're allowed to use a calculator. So if you oh, want, to, yeah. I can use a calculator. yeah. So she took uh, 1865 divided by 145. Did anybody else do that? Mm -hmm. And what'd you get? What is it? I got divided by 10.8. I got one. Oh, sorry. Did I say it wrong? Yeah. I got 173. Oh no. What is it? 173. 172.3? Yeah, seriously. Let's just do a new line. What should we do? That's what this is, right? It's a calculator. 1865? Was it exactly 10.8? Yeah. Or not exactly. Where we get that 10? The real marble after we ran the real marble, we saw when it hit. Okay, so 172.7 is your. Here we go. And they both hit it. 10.8. Okay. So now we switch to your creator hat. You're going to reproduce this. Oh. Not for Wednesday. I'll give you more time than that. Okay, good. It's not for Wednesday. So we'll see. Um, we'll say for Monday. So you got a week. Okay. So a lot of those things in the covariation file are new new things that you'll need here. So you need to, um, if you didn't figure out how all those things work, the way you use sliders to change the views and different things like that. So there's a, there's a view on this too. You can show just, so this now just, just shows uh, okay. the real marble. I know how you just put if. So no, and no running start, just the real marble. So you just think that like if. And then if you want to have that, okay. You don't have to have this text. This is very easy to do. You just open up text line and drag it in. You don't don't worry about that. Okay. But everything else. How many more command lines are there? Um, it depends. So what we'll do is um, after you have yours, after you've had yours and turned yours in, then we're going to do an analysis. I'm going to give you Dr. Thompson's version. I'm going to give you my version because I so I worked it out without looking at Dr. Thompson's, and they turned out very different. So you'll look at Dr. Thompson's. You'll look at mine and your own, and we'll talk about efficiency. We're going to talk about mathematical efficiency and setting this up. Okay?